Hi everyone, welcome back to my YouTube page. My name is Eric, and I hope you all had a wonderful week. This week we are going to be talking about miracles. Now, miracles are a very divisive topic, to say the least, even among Christians. Skeptics and atheists uh, are incredibly slow to believe them, and some are even downright hostile to the idea. We tend to be very skeptical of them in the West. Uh, Christians do believe, Orthodox Christians anyway, do believe in miracles. Uh, and we are typically very comfortable with believing the miracles in the Bible. But modern day miracles or anything like that, we tend to be very slow of believing, particularly in the West. The idea behind this video is to show that miracles do happen. That's pretty much my only goal for this video, although I will, in future videos, talk about uh, evidence for the Bible being true, uh, for Jesus being the only way, uh, but for now, I want to keep this video <laughs> under an hour, so I... Again, I couldn't possibly make a video covering all three of those topics without making it two or three hours. Uh, because So, again, for the purposes of this video, I want to make it a more focused topic. Uh, so I'm only going to talk about miracles. I'll also be uh, tackling objections from particularly atheists and skeptics. Uh, because they tend, to, again, to be the most vocal against miracles. And I plan to tackle a lot of their objections, because, again, uh, miracles are, ten are thought to be sort of uh, not reasonable to believe, or many other things like that. Yeah, so I intend to debunk atheist objections and provide positive evidence for miracles uh, as well. Now before I get into the evidence specifically of miracle cases uh, being valid, I must dispel a certain presupposition that a lot of people have, which is that miracles have to work like some sort of scientific process where you can repeat it, test it, uh, repeat it, um, do an experiment, basically repeat it like the law of gravity. This is false. Miracles do not have to be repeatable in order to be valid or reasonable to believe. Because miracles are personal causes. That is to say that they are caused by a personal agent. An agent who has a will, they have freedom of the will, they can choose to do something or not to do something. Let's say, for example, you know, my dad needs his house painted, and I decide, all right, fine, I'll do it. Now let's say two more times he needs it painted after that, and I decide to paint it again. But let's say on the fourth time, I just say, you know what, I, whatever, I'm not, I have other reasons for not wanting to do it, I just decide I'm not going to do it. Is it unreasonable to believe the fact that I painted my dad's house those three other times? No, of course not. It's not unreasonable to believe that, that I painted my dad's house those three times. It doesn't mean I'm incapable of doing it. It doesn't mean in the, those three other times didn't happen. Again, miracles are personal causes. They are not naturalistic processes that just mindlessly repeat themselves, like the law of gravity, for example, or any other law of physics or nature. Miracles are caused by an agent, so you can't use the same methods to sort of disprove that this is true. And it's the same thing with all historical events. You can't go back, repeat the experiments, repeat it like an experiment, and say, well, we can't repeat this, therefore it's unreasonable to believe. That's not how it works. 
there are certainly ways to know whether or not an event happened. And again, we're going to discuss some of the way of the evidence that we have that miracles did happen. I would also like to point out another misconception that is related to the first misconception, and it is the fact that in John 14, when Jesus says, you can ask anything in my name and I will do it, many people try and take this as some sort of magic formula to basically make God do whatever you want, whether it's, you know, getting a shiny new car in Jesus' name, or basically just uh, asking for any sort of uh, material thing you want, and uh, God is somehow going to do it. And that's not true. The phrase, in my name, uh, actually, according to the Bible, essentially means that you do something that is in line with the will of God. And in the case of Jesus, it is his overall plan for your life. I mean, for example, if you ask for, you know, a prostitute and say, in the name of Jesus, uh, I want that, you're not going to get it. Now, there are certain things that you can do that will hinder or help your chances of God answering your prayer. And I'll get into some of that near the end of the video, uh, but for now I want to dispel the notion that somehow, again, God, that, that God is somehow going to work like a formula where he's just going to grant you everything you want instantaneously uh, as long as you say, in Jesus' name, at the end of your prayers, uh, because that isn't true. Again, another disclaimer, this is not a video about how medical treatment is not necessary, because it is. God typically doesn't do miracles whenever there is a natural cure available. Uh, for example, uh, the famous story of the Gospel of Matthew, uh, with the issue of bl with the woman who had the issue of blood, she was waiting for 12 years, doing everything in her power to cure this. And all that failed, and then Jesus healed her. Now again, atheists have made a universal statement. They've made a universal statement that there is no evidence for any miracles at all. And here's the thing. Universal statements are the easiest statements to refute if they are false. Because again, all it takes is just one example. I could say, for example, that all business owners are just corrupt, evil people. Well, okay, fine, you may be able to point out plenty of examples of that happening, but again, to disprove that universal statement, all it takes is one example. I understand that many people have other objections that I didn't address yet, but again, I'll address them at a later point in the video. For now, let's get into the evidence. So, just so you know, the sources for the stories that I'm about to tell you uh, will be in the description if you want to look it up yourself or just know where I got the information from. There was a woman named Barbara, and she was diagnosed with progressive multiple sclerosis. Over 16 years, she spent many hours and even months in the hospital due to the fact that she couldn't breathe. Her diaphragm was paralyzed, which rendered one of her lungs completely non-active and non-functional, and the other was at less than 50%. She also needed a tube inserted into her neck with oxygen pumped through canisters. Uh, she was blind, couldn't control her bowel movements, she couldn't walk, uh, and she was needed to have oxygen pumped into her to continuously survive. She was on hospice with uh, less than six months to live, and soon after that, um, 
and soon after that, the there were many Christians, about 450 in fact, who prayed for her. And this was on a Sunday in 1981. And the truth is, uh, she was healed completely. She heard a voice which said, get up and walk. And she sure enough did. Also, there was a story of a then 62-year-old man named Carl who had fractured his ankle. This would have required uh, months of physical therapy. And, of course, Jesus healed him easily uh, and so completely to the point where there was no point evidence of any injury, period. The x-rays after the fracture, after the fracture was healed, uh, whereas the x-rays before it showed that there was clearly a very big fracture there. Also, if you think these examples are just one-offs one and isolated examples, 90% of Christians in China report that seeing a miracle was the reason why they became Christians in the first place. Also, for the record, these miracles reported by the Chinese Christians include healing from permanent blindness, healing from being crippled, and even being raised from the dead, and of course a lot more that I don't have time to get into right now. And keep in mind, there are tons of people in China who come from other religions, and this is socially costly to be a Christian in China. Uh, many of them will face social backlash. Others will even face worse persecution than that. Um, it's very costly. It's not something that people would simply just make up or willingly go into. Now, many people might say, well, who cares if they die for something that they believe in? You know? People die for things that, that are not true all the time, and that is true. However, whenever somebody tells you something, there are three major possibilities. One is that they're telling the truth. Two is that they're lying to you, and they know that they're lying. Or three, they are telling you a falsehood, but they think they're telling you the truth. Now, here's the thing. You can't be... For example, let's take suicide bombers, for instance. They do really believe what they, that they are going to die in the cause of Islam, for example. They really do believe that. They really do believe that they're going to die and go to paradise, um, you know, and get their 72 virgins and everything. It's perfectly understandable why they would believe it, because they've been raised uh, to believe that since since they usually come from majority Muslim countries, and that's standard beliefs there. Now, so it's perfectly understandable why they would believe that sincerely. Now, you can't say that with the Christians in China. You can't say that somebody can be sincerely deceived about being permanently blind, or dead, or crippled. You can't say things like that and think you're telling the truth if it's not the truth. Of course, you could ask, well, what, what if they're just lying? Well, again, if they're just lying, people lie oftentimes to save face or to gain something. There's nothing to gain by doing this. They already have a religion. They already have a different religion that they believe in. And they don't have anything to gain by making up these stories. They don't have anything to gain to willfully deceive people. They're ba basically being thrown out of their families and possibly even worse. So there isn't anything to gain and by that. So it makes it much less likely that they are willfully deceiving people. So if they can't be willf they're not willfully deceiving anybody, and it's uh, and they can't be uh, sincerely deceived, then the most likely option is that they are telling the truth. Right. Even if you want to say that there are some people in there who believe or just lied for stupid reasons or something, fine. Maybe a couple. Uh, 
90% of those people, which is potentially millions of people, not very likely. Also, another statistic would say that 80% of Lutheran churchgoers uh, said they came to Christ because of miracles and exorcisms. Also, James Rutz, in his book, book Mega Shift, has documented people being raised from the dead in up to 52 countries since the 1980s. For people who may still be doubting this, there are reports from India that 10% of non-Christians have also experienced miraculous healing at the hands of the Christian God, and 20% of non-Christians in that same survey at least knew about it. In other words, they may not have experienced themselves, but they knew somebody who did. And if you are still not convinced that miracles do still happen today, I have this final book right here. It is Miracles by Craig Ke It's a book by Craig Keener, and it is this one volume alone is 500 pages long. More than 500, actually. And there are documented reports that range from singular stories to anecdotal stories to full-on studies, surveys in different countries, in South America, the Philippines, African countries, basically all over the world. There are countless examples of that. And, the, and even throughout history, and there's even a few from around the 3rd century. There are countless ones there. Honestly, just keep reading, just keep reading it again and again and again. The odds that all of those stories, you know, maybe some of them are false, fine. You could probably find a few that maybe not be reliable, or maybe even some that, are, that can be disproven, but not all. The sheer number of them makes that highly unlikely. And if you're still not convinced after this, there is volume two of the same series, which has, again, constant miracles throughout history, throughout different countries, different surveys, statistics, medical reports. It, the list goes on. So honestly, again, it's just, you can say that there are some stories that are false, and I'm willing to believe that. But all of them? That is not very likely. Now, and again, remember what I said before. Miracles, all you need is one to refute the universal statement. And even if you personally may not be convinced after all of that, uh, leaving aside the fact that there are other books that list different surveys still, and again, I don't have time to go into all of it in this video without making it a two hour long video, which I don't want to do. To be honest, even if you want to say, well, I'm just not convinced, fine. You can't call other people unreasonable because they do believe it. There's a link to a skeptic who once did read this book, and it satisfied even his high standards for the burden of proof. Some of them. Now, not all of them, but some of them. Now, this skeptic is a friend of Philip Yancey, and Philip Yancey put his story on, on his blog. So, as you can see here, it's on the post of titled Jesus and Miracles. And again, keep in mind, skeptics have a very high standard. So the fact that a good number of them actually did manage to surprise him is high praise. And then, of course, many people... Uh, if they don't just resort to outright mockery, we'll simply say, well, you know, what uh, What about Elvis stories, huh? 
Elvis stories, do you believe Elvis stories? No, so we have to be hyper-skeptical of miracle stories. Or do you believe in alien abductions? Do you believe that? No, I do not. And part of the reason for that is that Elvis stories are easily debunkable, and you read, and again, links in the description. And furthermore, alien abduction stories, again, some of them are a bit harder to explain than others, but generally speaking, again, they are far less frequent than miracle stories, and on top of that, they have only been around for a short time compared to miracles. Miracles have been around since, well, literally God only knows how long. So, miracles have happened, they've been a part of our history for countless centuries and millennia. And you know what? Let's say tomorrow I don't know, a 2,000-page document comes out documenting alien stories. That doesn't refute my case for the miracles or make it any less impressive. That would only mean that, well, I guess aliens exist. You know, if you have 2,000 pages worth of constant, non-stop studies, testimony over the course of years in that way, fine. I might be willing to listen. If you run into two things that have good evidence, and they're both controversial things, then you believe both controversial things. Again, there's nothing wrong with, in theory, at least not that I can see, from believing in aliens. It'd certainly be a shake-up to the status quo, but who cares? For the purposes of this topic, it's irrelevant. So it's a false equivalency. It doesn't work. Now, a lot of skeptics will try and say, well, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Therefore, what you said is what you presented isn't good enough. Now, as catchy a phrase as that might be, it doesn't work. Firstly, because extraordinary is too subjective a term. It's too ambiguous, it's too undefined, and it can't work in an objective analysis. Furthermore, like, whatever athe... I mean, what is extraordinary evidence? Is it 50% evidence greater? Is it twice as much evidence as normal? Is it five times, ten times, twenty or even a hundred times? What's the bare minimum? Again, that's subjective. And it validates bias. Furthermore, what is an extraordinary claim? To many Muslims, for example, it's an extraordinary claim to claim that, well, Islam, that somebody has ever left Islam. But again... It's not an extraordinary claim to me as a Christian, and it's certainly, I would highly doubt that it's, a, that it's an extraordinary claim to any atheists, for that matter. At least I highly doubt it. Atheists and skeptics do not have a patent on whether a claim is extraordinary. They are not the judges over what is objectively extraordinary and what is objectively uh, you know, within the realm of respectable debate. They don't have a monopoly on it, and they don't get to claim, oh, well, this is extraordinary because we just find it extraordinary. That's not good enough. Especially when, for the majority of human history, and even the majority of people today, miracle... It's not an extraordinary claim to believe that God exists. I mean, it certainly isn't. They have to actually do the work and, and say, well, this is why it's extraordinary. 
Now, here's the thing. Many atheists will try and say, well, you have the burden of proof. You have to prove that the Bible is true or that miracles happen. You're the one making the claim. Well, you're correct, but here's the thing. Just because somebody has the burden of proof does not oblige them to just indulge unreasonable skepticism. It does not oblige them to capitulate to demands of certain amounts of evidence. Anybody who makes a positive claim at any point in the discussion is obliged to defend it, and this in and of itself, the statement that this is an extraordinary claim, is a positive statement. It doesn't matter how you want to phrase it, how you want to uh, chop it up, it doesn't matter. It's a positive statement, and it has to be defended. And some people will try and actually get around this by saying, well, testimony and word is not evidence. Yes, it is. It is evidence. Testimony is allowed in a court of law. Oh. Now, you may claim, oh, oh, well, I'm just not convinced. Fine. It still is considered evidence. Now, in certain cases, it may not be sufficient evidence. In some cases it is, some cases it isn't. But it is evidence. And keep in mind, the fact that it's valid evidence in a court of law at all does say something, because in courts of law, the burden of proof for, for example, criminal prosecution in pretty much any regard is so high that it has to be beyond all reasonable doubt. You know, for example, if you have, if the guy has a 75% chance of having committed the crime, and there's a 25% chance that he didn't, well, very often they'll basically say, well, it's still reasonable doubt, so we can't prosecute him. And the fact that testimony is a valid form of evidence in that context which has such a high burden, does say something that, it, yes, it is reliable. Is it perfect? No. But here's a newsflash. There is no perfect form. There is no form of evidence that has ever not been manipulated. And yes, testimony has been misused in the past where people have lied. That's true. I'm not going to deny that. But a form of evidence does not have to have an absolutely spotless track record in order to be considered evidence. And if anybody wants to claim that it is notoriously unreliable or eyewitness testimony because skeptics keep claiming this more and more every year, where, oh, well, eyewitness testimony is notoriously unreliable, or, you know, it's just not something we can trust, I would leave a link below. Can it be misused? Yeah, it can. But again, you can't, uh, again, a piece, a standard of evidence, a form of evidence does not have to have an absolutely spotless track record in order to be considered a valid form of evidence. Period. Now, many people, uh, for example, one of them is Bart Ehrman, at one point advanced in their book that saying, well, miracles are, by definition, improbable events. Therefore, we can't say that it probably happened. Well, there are two problems with this. One is that no, miracles are not inherently implausible. They happen at the behest of an agent, of a personal agent. So you can't say that it's implausible or plausible. It happens whenever the, per whenever the being in charge, or in this case, God, wants them to. So it's not implausible. Secondly, even if miracles were implausible, like, improbable, 
in terms of mathematically uh, rare. Here's the problem. Winning the lottery is also mathematically wa uh, rare. Now, there are two different things. The probability that an event did happen in the past and the probability of it happening in the first place. Now, the probability of this person winning the lottery was extremely low. But the odds that it didn't happen when you have documentation of it, when you have, uh, in some cases, you even have it, you know, on video of the people getting the money and all that, the probability that it did happen can be much higher than the probability the initial probability of it happening in the first place. So it doesn't work to try and say, well, you know, it's an improbable event, therefore it probably didn't happen. I, I'm telling you, every single one of these variations on the argument, they all fail in the same way. They all presuppose what they are trying to prove. They presuppose it by saying that, well, a miracle is more, is less plausible than any of that. That is a positive statement that needs to be addressed. That it, uh, again, it doesn't matter whether you have the burden of proof or not. Even if you do have the burden of proof, that doesn't mean that the negative side that is denying your proposition. That does not mean that they get to make positive claims and get away with it. Any person at any point who makes a positive claim, regardless of what side they are on, has to justify it. And claiming that miracles are implausible or that they are inherently implausible or less likely, that is a positive claim. And yes, it has to be backed up. What you need to do is you need to start from a neutral standpoint. You don't get to demand extraordinary evidence unless it is actually justified. You cannot claim, well, this is extraordinary, an extraordinary claim because miracles have never happened. That's begging the question. We have to investigate first whether miracles have ever happened, and then we can have see whether it's an extraordinary claim or not. But until that happens, we have to look at the documents with open eyes, without the extraordinary evidence burden. And once you have that, you out of the way, you really can't deny the evidence any longer. Now many people might even say, well why isn't any of these things reported on the news or anything? First of all, there are secular news organizations aren't going to report on this because they aren't going to favor one religion over another. They're not going to deliberately say something that is overtly positive towards one religion in that regard. They're, they're just not. It's going to alienate their viewers. It's going to alienate uh, many other people. Uh, whether it's, if in this case it's Christianity, they're going to alienate their secular viewers or their, or maybe even their Hindu viewers, Jewish viewers, is Muslim viewers, anybody else. So, again, there are countless stories that are are covered by the media and there are also even more countless stories that are not. They only have so much time in the day and they're not going to simply, again, just have miracle stories that are going to cost them money and funds by telling people and alienating a good portion of their audience. And as for Christian news organizations, well, actually, they have interviewed people who have had miracles happen to them. 
many other atheists will try and, and say, well, look, we know we've never seen miracles, and this would be change, this would be world changing. We clearly have to be careful about believing this certain thing. Well, first of all, if somebody says that to you, they've demonstrated that they have a conflict of interest. If they are more concerned about their livelihood or any of that, it's clear that this is going to impact them. Now, I'm not saying that you should just drop everything and just accept anything that's going to flip your worldview upside down. But don't call other people unreasonable who don't have that same disadvantage, who might accept it more uh, readily. And atheists may say, well, this would be worldwide news, so why wouldn't news organizations want to cover it? Well, not really. The only people whose worldview would change is atheists. It would change it for some people, but the majority of people still believe in miracles in the U.S. The overwhelming majority of people throughout the world also believe in the supernatural world. What really happened was during, you know, the Enlightenment periods or, or that sort of thing, certain people started being skeptical. They convinced some people to no longer believe in miracles, and they've, and now they all demand, oh, well, we just have to believe, you know, we're just unreasonable because we don't, we believe in miracles when really they've only managed to convince a few people with question-begging logic and bad arguments. And many Christian and many atheists will try and say, well, we're objective, you know, we, we're not as biased as Christians, we, we, we're open to evidence and everything else. Well, statistically speaking, that's not true. And again, once again, if you want to look below, there is a link there for the evidence of that. Now, many people might even claim, basically, well, I've never seen miracles, and I've never experienced them, I don't know anybody who has. The fact that you didn't grow up with something doesn't mean it's unreasonable to believe. Okay? Or just because you've never experienced something yourself doesn't mean it's unreasonable to believe. I've never broken my arm, but I know it hurts. I don't need to break my arm myself to know that it's painful and that it's bad. Again, because we have countless testimony and countless verification that it does hurt. If somebody tells you that breaking your arm hurts, do you really need to break your arm yourself in order to prove to yourself that it does? And if you do, if you need to break your own arm to answer that question, are you a genius? Now, many people... Now, a lot of other people will say, oh, well, are you saying God just arbitrarily decides who he's, whose prayers he's going to answer? Well, no, actually. There is a certain degree of unpredictability with God, but there are some things that you can do that will actually increase your chances of having prayers answered. Number one is actually forgiveness. The Bible says that you, as that you can forgive people. That if you forgive people, God, your prayers will not be hindered. Another thing that will hinder your prayers is specifically directed at husbands in the book of Second Peter. Or I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry. It's actually First Peter. The Bible actually says, as that if you if you treat your wife improperly. Or if you are harsh with her, God may not answer your prayers. 
God also doesn't answer prayers that are prayed with selfish motives in the book of James. God also has stated that sometimes he wants us to pray with persistence, like in the book of Luke chapter 18. Jesus tells the parable of the persistent widow who keeps on asking, who keeps on asking, who keeps going in and keeps pressing in, and then finally gets what she wants. Many Christians just simply pray one time and then that's it. That's it. They just pray and then just give up. Now, I'm not saying that it's guaranteed to work every single time, but a lot more people could be healed if we obeyed these certain principles. Now, a lot of atheists will try and say, oh yeah, well, what about other religions? I mean, you don't believe miracle stories from other religions, so why should we believe them from Christians? And they'll basically try to accuse us of being, you know, inconsistent or something. Well, again, that's simply not true. I can accept miracles from other religions. And here's the thing. Atheists can't accept any miracles. Okay? Again, atheists, again, Christianity does believe that there are uh, either demonic forces out there or... In some cases, God may even be generous to other people uh, who are non-Christians and may simply decide, you know what, I'll just heal them. He may do that. I'm not going to deny that that's a possibility. But, again, this isn't the knockout blow that atheists think it is. In fact, it's more of a knockout blow for atheism. Because what's... Because, again... Atheism and naturalism. No miracles happen. Christianity can accept miracles, for example, from Hindus, or sometimes even Buddhists, or Muslims, or anything else. Christianity at least has a chance of being true in that case. Atheism's out. Now, one final rebuttal that atheists will try and go after is they will try and say, well, this is just God of the gaps. In other, and if you don't know what that is, they will try and say, well, at different times in the past, you know, people believed certain things were supernatural that we now know have, you know, a natural explanation. You know, for example, they say, well, we used to think that lightning was, you know, you know, uh, above the laws of nature. But now we know that, you know, this, that happens naturally. So therefore, you know, it, all supernatural occurrences are just like that. We, we just haven't found a natural explanation yet. You cannot say that because other things that were once viewed as supernatural are now viewed as natural. Uh, therefore, all of them will eventually be. You can't say that, and here's why. Not all scientific research is created equally. The research that's being done, for example, on the human body and how it works is far more sophisticated, far more thorough, far more meticulous than anything that ancient people could manage. Assuming that our methods are just as equally likely to result in wrong uh, analysis as theirs are is simply false. Okay? So, the only thing ancient people did was... Basically, they looked at it from afar. They looked at it. They assumed that the supernatural... They assumed that lightning was supernatural because they just couldn't explain it. That's not what scientists are doing today. Scientists today have done countless peer-reviewed articles, research, hours on the human body. Uh, there's countless empirical evidence 
and it's far greater than anything the ancient people could have managed. That same research has shown that commanding your body to be healed from serious injuries, uh, especially permanent ones like being crippled, being blind, and most certainly being dead, uh, it doesn't happen in the natural if you just talk to your body and tell it to heal itself. There are countless scientific studies that will say that, which means that a natural cause is not really feasible. So skeptics can't just pick out some obscure examples from the past to say, well, oh, this supernatural thing here, that was later explained as a natural event, therefore every single event now is going to be eventually disproven as, an, as a supernatural event. It's not good enough. Another thing to consider uh, is that 200 years ago, atheists used to say, you know what, the universe has always existed. It's eternal. We don't need to explain it. You know, we, we don't need to explain, we don't need God, we don't need any, we don't need to explain the origin because it's, it's eternal, it doesn't matter. You know, it could have always been here. And to be fair, you don't have to explain how something came into existence if there's no evidence that it had a beginning. So if it didn't have evidence that it had a beginning, fine, you know, that might have been a fair point. The problem is, atheists can't hide behind that anymore. Scientists have a pretty strong consensus that the universe had a beginning. Now, atheist scientists will try and say, well, you know, it, it does have a beginning, but, you know, it's not God. It, God isn't the cause, it's something else. And okay, fine, but here's the thing. If I simply say, if I simply said, well, you know what? This has grown more like the Bible over time. This has grown more like the Bible over time. Therefore, you know, we, we can just fill in the gaps and we can just say, well, you know what? We can just assume that God is going to be found out to be the cause one day. I don't think atheists would accept that. They would probably force, they would force us to show step by step in the present that God is the best explanation for the universe existing. And until we did that, they probably wouldn't believe. My point is that you can't just insert the idea of, well, this story was disproven, therefore all of them will be eventually. That's sloppy thinking. It'd be like if I said, well, you know what? All wives are cheaters. And I have tons of examples of it happening. Well, okay, fine. And then I just, and then what if somebody says, well, this other wife, she never cheated, and I just said, nah, you just haven't found her out, or she will in the future. And you know what? If she dies and has been supposedly faithful, she must have just gotten away with it. Would anybody consider me reasonable for believing that? I doubt it. And the thing is, is that in many ways it shares similarities with that. In fact, if you're willing to just say, well, we'll find the evidence eventually. You can pretty much defend anything you want. Going back to the example about wives. Imagine if a wife, you know, for example, I, if I was committed to the idea that all wives are cheaters and they will cheat eventually, then I could just dismiss anything. I could believe that and nothing could possibly persuade me otherwise. Somebody could show me an example of you know, a woman being constantly asked to cheat by a whole bunch of guys and she could slap every one of them in the face and people would still 
you know, I would say, well, it'll happen eventually, or I don't know this, or it was staged or some, some other excuse. I could just as easily come up with that. Or, you know, if a wife was threatened at gunpoint to cheat and she still didn't, I could just say, well, you know what, whatever, that's just, you know, it, it, it she'll do it eventually. It's like, at a certain point, you really, really have to question whether or not somebody is really being reasonable if they say, well, we'll find it eventually, and you're unreasonable for not believing that we'll find it eventually. Well, thank you for watching, everybody. I really hope you all enjoyed the video. Uh, please give it a like and uh, subscribe if you want to see more content. As I said, the purpose of this video was to talk only about evidence for miracles. Um, but as I said, uh, there are a lot of different things, a lot of different topics that I will cover in the future, such as evidence for the Bible being true, uh, Jesus being the only way, and many others. Again, uh, the sources for the information will be in the description. Uh, if you like this video or have any feedback, uh, please leave a comment. I know this video might be a bit rough because uh, I had to film this three times due to computer and technical problems, uh, as well as camera trouble, so hopefully it came out alright, but again, uh, I definitely intend to improve. Uh, and if you want to see my improvements later, just uh, hit the like and subscribe button, and I'll see y'all soon in a new Oom um video. Bye, guys.